introduction is to minimize the introduction time and maximize the speaking time so we can keep it brief. Uh, we have two speakers with us today. We have State Representative Tommy Thompson and State Senator Gary Rhodes. Uh, they've both been in those positions since 2003. And uh, they've come to speak with us today and uh, maybe answer a few questions. I don't know which of you is going first. I'll let you fight over. Come on up. Chris, thank you. We'll uh, kind of go together here. Chris, I want to applaud you for winning the door prize. I saw Hayward brought his own ticket, and he wrote, yeah. he wrote the number in. <laughs> it was a mail, so you, you kind of got it to the draw. But that was it's really a pleasure on behalf of Jerry and I to be back here with the chamber and always enjoy visiting with you all. And, sharing some thoughts and ideas more than anything listening to you but this gives us an opportunity to do something we were able to do last year and that's uh, have an overview of the recently concluded session of the general assembly so what i thought we would do is i'm going to start off and talk a little bit about the budget which certainly as cb knows was the most important job that we had in this session and then jerry is going to talk about some of the laws that we passed some of the more significant bills that we passed talk about some that didn't pass and then I thought uh, I would end up talking a little bit about the road plan, which uh, ended up being very good for Ohio County. And then, as always, the best part of this for Jerry and I is to take your all's questions and your concerns and issues and advice uh, that we can certainly learn and benefit from. So we'll try to proceed that way. And then we also have a little presentation that we want to make at the very end also. Uh, but to start off, uh, we concluded our session on April the 15th. This was our long session, our budget year. And as I mentioned, clearly the most important thing we had to do was pass a new two-year budget for the state to guide our investments and our policy going forward. And I'm glad to say that, Edith, we were able to do that on time this year. We, we adjourned by passing a budget. We did it in a bipartisan way. Uh, we had uh, agreement across the board in a lot of areas. Uh, but more than anything, we don't have to go back into a special session and have a, a budget session, which we've done uh, too many times over the last several years. Uh, the budget that we passed, uh, we had a, we really had a tight fiscal situation in Kentucky. Our revenues are improving, but still not enough to meet all the needs that we had. So we, again, were faced with a tight budget. But with that, we were able to make investments uh, in Kentuckians and in laws that I think will help create jobs in Kentucky. I think they'll serve to protect our most vulnerable and also support our families and businesses in Kentucky. Clearly, the, the primary emphasis of our budget this year was to reinvest in education. Uh, we haven't been able to keep up with the investment that we need to make in primary and secondary over the last budget cycle because of the contraction in our revenues. We've had a lot of momentum in education, but I hope you all would agree that education is job going for Kentucky. I think we've got to make sure that our, our kids and our adults have the skills and trades and abilities they need to be successful and they need to be employable. So we've got to continue the momentum that we have going in education. So with that, the governor started with his submission of the budget in late January and it redirected a lot of money from other departments, other agencies into primary and secondary. And just kind of a quick recap, our budget in total was $20.3 billion over the two years. And in education, we were able to increase the SEEK formula for the first time since about 2008. We had it, held it flat, but this time we were actually able to increase. And by doing that, we did something that we had wanted to do for years but didn't have the revenues to do it, but we are going to be able to provide teacher raises. We all know how important they are in the education delivery system. Having been able to raise teacher salaries over the last several years, this budget will allow that. It will be a 1% increase in the first year of the biennium and 2% in the second year. In addition to that, we increased the strands of education, the so-called flex focus funds, which again had been significantly cut over the last three or four years. These are things like professional development, which our teachers need, extended school <coughs> services, textbooks. Jerry and I know it's been five years since we've been able to fund textbooks in Kentucky. This budget is going to allow that. And also significantly we invested in classroom technology. It's amazing when I go to an elementary school and see the technology that these young people are using today with their iPads and so forth. And 
we need more broadband capacity. We need more highways so the schools can connect to that and help our kids learn. So we, we had more money in, in uh, technology in the classroom. Uh, another area where we invested uh, for primary and secondary is in preschool. Uh, we're putting uh, another 5,100 slots are going to be available for Kentucky fourth graders to go into preschool. I saw an article the other day that was really perplexing that two-thirds of Kentucky's fourth graders can't read at grade level when they're in the fourth grade. And then you, we all know if they can't read at grade level by the third or fourth grade, they may always be behind. We know what happens if they're behind. <clears throat> they stay behind. So we put significantly more money into preschool to allow 5,100 more, hopefully, fourth graders uh, to have the advantage of preschool benefits and that early learning so they'll be ready for kindergarten. They'll be ready for the first grade and they'll have the skills to uh, start off in a successful way. Uh, some other investments that we made were in the post-secondary arena. We talked about primary and secondary where the majority of Charlotte of our emphasis was put, but in our post-secondary, the governor had proposed, unfortunately, a 2.5% cut to our post-secondary institutions, our colleges and universities. Unfortunately, we cut them in the previous cycle, and we've all seen what's happened to tuition. It's a sad comment when you hear that CC kids can't afford for higher education because they can't afford it. But we were able to shift some money, and we reduced that cut to 1.5% instead of 2.5%. One thing that we did that will really help our region, though, is that we passed $145 million of bonds that are going to allow every community campus in Kentucky. There's 16 community campuses around the state, every one of them will be able to build their number one project. And for us in this region, the Advanced Technology Center at Owensboro Community and Technical College will now finally be allowed to be built. About $13.5 million, of which about $9 million will come from bonds that the state is going to issue, and then another $4.5 million has to be raised locally. So if you will, there's going to have to be sweat equity into that project and every other one around the state. But we really need those advanced manufacturing facilities so we can retrain existing workforces for new technology, new robotics that are being used. We need it for displaced workers that need to be retrained so that they can have a gainful employment. And I think it'll be a real plus for our region to have that advanced technology center and to provide the training that we desperately need. So, And then also uh, we provided some bonds for our universities to expand some of their projects. So, Post-secondary, we hate the cut had to be put in place, but at least we minimized that and we've got some learning facilities that are becoming on board. Uh, in the area of economic development, the investments that we made there, among other things, is that we put another $30 million into creating a high-speed broadband highway for Kentucky. Uh, Burl Morris, and if you all know Burl, probably you had to go a month without calling me and saying, what are you all doing about you know increasing internet access here, more broadband capacity? So we're putting in a network across Kentucky, eastern Kentucky and western Kentucky, to provide more high-speed internet. Because so many individuals need, kids need it for school, but we need it for our businesses, particularly our small businesses, to let them you know compete in this global economy that we're in. So I thought that was really plus. We put in a, a veterinarian uh, facility down in Hopkinsville that was the number one project for Farm Bureau, about $32 million. That will help our whole veterinarian area and our ag area in Kentucky. And then we put in a, uh, about $23 million, $24 million, I guess, for an advanced technology center uh, connected with Toyota. You all may have read that they're going to be producing the Lexus area. And as a quick aside, uh, this serve was news to me when I heard this a number of months ago, but Kentucky now is the third largest automobile producing state in the nation. The third largest. And a lot of opportunities around automobile manufacturing companies that are locating here to supply Corvette and Bowling Green, Ford, and of course Toyota, where I think they're going to be doing about 500,000 cars a year there. But um, that was significant. A couple of things uh, quickly on the state investment side. Um, we talked before, Jerry and I have you all read a lot about the situation with Kentucky's pension plan, the KRS and the KTRS, the teachers and the state employees, uh, both of them have unfunded liabilities. We needed to put them on a more solid financial ground. So we, we passed a bill a little over a year ago to start making 100% of the required contribution to the plan to stabilize it over years, which I think by doing that, 
we'll hopefully realize about a $20 billion savings for the Commonwealth over the next 10 years. But we committed and did that again with this budget. We met and made the 100% the contribution to it. So I think that was really positive. We need to address the, the teacher's plan. It's in a little more solid ground, but we're going to have to put some, uh, if you will, some improvements there and a new plan to move it forward over the next 15 or 20 years, which I think will be a, addressing when we go back. Doug, you, you talked about that. Um, Charlotte, one great thing we did in, in aging and independent services is we increased 3,500 slots for Meals on Wheels. Uh, there's a waiting list here in Ohio County. There's a waiting list in Davis County. It's horrible. And that sometimes, as you well know, is the only time a senior or a person will, will see somebody in a day when they get a nutritious meal, a hot meal. So we put 3,500 more slots in for that. But on balance, it was a, it was a pretty good budget with the limited resources we had. No new taxes. Um, we didn't broach tax reform, which we can talk about later, and I think we need to going forward in the state, but this budget is not balanced with any new taxes. It redirects some, some funds and resources into areas where hopefully we can get the best return on our investments. Uh, but uh, there was a lot of agencies, a lot of needs that are unmet. We still had to cut a number of agencies and departments, Nancy, by 25 to 5% on top of 20 and 30 percent cuts that they've already had and already experienced. So we've got additional work to do. But uh, <coughs> one final thing, and then I'm going to turn it over to Jerry, that we did too was in child care. $97 million more in child care over the biennium. And the reason that's so important, you all may have read back in June or uh, July of last year, the federal government reduced the eligibility from 150 percent of federal poverty down to 100 percent. So, so many people were disenfranchised from having the availability of child care. And you all know how important that is. These are primarily low-income families who are trying to lift themselves up. They are people that want to continue their education so they can be employable, so they have to go to school. Or they're people that are working and they need daycare so they can continue to work. But when those funds were cut, a lot of them couldn't do either. And then they had to go back home or they had to leave the child with someone who was less than desired. So we put $97 million more into child care over the next two years, which I think will really help those people that are trying to help themselves. So that's kind of a, a quick overview of that budget. And I certainly will be wanting to answer any questions you have later. But Jerry now is going to talk about the, the bills, both that passed and didn't pass. Thank you, Tom. As usual with Tommy, I conclude there's not a whole lot left to say. <laughs> it's so thorough. And I'm happy to be uh, the other half of Tom and Jerry's show here that frequently has put on. Um, a couple of other items I'd like to uh, supplement a little bit. I think are very important that we were able to do this time in the budget process. Uh, for the first time in five or six years, Tom, we were able to give state employees yes. place in addition to other teachers. And uh, we followed the governor's uh, plan on this. <clears throat> he structured it on a tiered basis so that the lower income workers would get a higher raise <clears throat> because they're raising taxes to a lower base uh, where they would actually get uh, a bit more than, than those in the higher categories. So we were very happy. Uh, it really is appalling to, to see some of the wages that we pay our state workers. Uh, I know some of the very lowest paid are their corrections officers. Uh, it, it's really sad to see what we're paying some of our state employees, and, and they're overdue for a raise. I know in District 2, in our transportation cabinet office in Madisonville, they're having a horrible time trying to recruit engineers. Uh, they can't compete with the private sector. And so we're going to have to do something about our professional employees and try to bring those salaries up in line with uh, maybe not matching the private sector, but making them more competitive than we are now. And on the pension side, I'm really happy that we were able to meet the commitment that we made earlier uh, in the 13th session when we made some pension uh, commitments uh, and on the teacher retirement 
uh, not only were we able to uh, make our actuarially required contributions, but we were able also to meet the bond obligations that we assumed when we paid off the loan that we took out from the teacher retirement system. <coughs> so we're on schedule and we're moving in the right direction on, the, on our pension system. Just a brief overview on the bills that we passed. You might be interested to know, a uh, whole lot more bills are introduced than are passed as CB knows, and all of us know we file bills and never get passed. I'm not picking on you, CB, but I'm, uh, uh, most bills that are filed are not passed. It'll be interesting to know that in the 14th session, 500, uh, excuse me, a total of 820 bills were filed, uh, 580 in the House, and uh, 240 in the Senate. And uh, for those that became law, 140 became law out of a total of 820. Not a high percentage, but pretty much in line with what it has been. 2012, 771 bills were filed, uh, and 154 became law. So it's a rather tortuous process to get a bill passed. Um, and that's not all bad, uh, because uh, they go through a very thorough vetting process in the committee system and have to pass both houses, and, and then, of course, the governor has to sign them. Uh, I want to highlight a few bills that we did pass, and I'm going to have a, a handout for you that I'll lay on the table over here, which is a fairly complete list, I think, of the most significant bills that we did pass, and one page of bills that we did not pass. I always like to cover that part, too, so you'll know what we did and what we didn't do. And sometimes what we don't do is not all bad. Sometimes what we don't do is maybe better than what we do. But anyway, I want to highlight a few bills that were passed. Uh, they, they've got a lot of, uh, a lot of you have already read about them. I think locally one of the most important bills that was passed was House Bill 2, which is the Kentucky Cole County College Completion Program. Uh, this qualifies people who have finished 60 degree, uh, hours of credit to complete their college degree if they live in a coal producing county, including Ohio County, including Muhlenberg County, including Hopkins County, three of the four counties in, in my current district. Uh, we're going to have to find some coal in Butler and bring them in too. So uh, but anyway, it's a very good program. It provides uh, scholarship money, uh, encourages uh, our folks to complete their college degree. A lot of people will get part of it, they maybe get 60 hours or so, but uh, they don't have the funds to, uh, to go off to college. Uh, and the, the uh, incidence of college grads these counties is not where it needs to be, so I think this will encourage more people to complete their college degree. Probably also read about the bill that we passed, uh, the Canvas Oil Bill. It got a lot of uh, publicity. It uh, provides that Canvas Oil, uh, which is reputed to be very helpful to control uh, chronic epileptic conditions. I know there was some gut-wrenching testimony, Tommy, in the House and the Senate both. Uh, my parents who brought children forward who were having very, very severe epileptic seizures. Uh, and there's been some encouraging signs that uh, this cannabis oil will, will help control these or at least reduce them. But it's got a long way to go. Uh, this bill provides for trials in the UK and UL. Uh, we've got some FDA issues to work through. Uh, the availability of the oil is very limited right now. It's not certain we can even ship it across state lines. And it's a very expensive, it's a very expensive process for these trials. I think about $10,000 per, per trial. So this has got a long way to go, but it may offer some promise in the future. For, uh, for children and adults with 
chronic seizure conditions. We passed a concealed carry uh, bill, which is very comprehensive, uh, allows retired law enforcement officers who were granted a concealed carry license in their work to carry concealed anywhere in the state, except for detention facilities. Makes school security officers eligible for, for homeland security grants. Also provides a process by under which uh, those that are protected by emergency protective or domestic violence orders can get a temporary concealed carry permit. Uh, also, we have outlawed the availability of e-cigarettes, electronic cigarettes, which are proliferating quite a bit. We see more and more of that. Uh, under Senate Bill 109, we cannot sell electronic cigarettes to minors, <coughs> just like regular cigarettes. Uh, they're sometimes uh, marketed as a safer alternative. There's a lot of research yet to be done to, to determine if that really is the case. But under this bill, you cannot sell it to minors. Another important bill is the Adult Abuse Registry, Senate Bill 98. And uh, I know many of you who have had uh, experience in this area, such as Charlotte and others, uh, understand the importance of being able to screen people who work in situations with families who assume the role as caregivers. Uh, the Cabinet for Health and Family Services will maintain a database uh, under which persons can be checked out if they're prospective employees for nursing homes, adult care agencies. Uh, families have no way of knowing the credentials and the background of prospective employees. So this is a this is a good way to be able to screen persons to see if they have anything in their record that uh, might disqualify them or make them unfit to serve in their role. Uh, kinship caregivers, this is also, I think, a good bill, Senate Bill 276. Uh, we're seeing more and more children in our state being raised by their grandparents, maybe their aunts, their uncles, uh, even their siblings. Uh, and they have a difficult time uh, getting uh, authorization for medical treatment in school type phase. Uh, quite often they have to go to court, go to district court to be appointed guardian, which is kind of a time consuming offer process. This bill will prevent upon the signing of an affidavit uh, which uh, affirms their role, uh, their capacity, where they can now authorize treatment and educational services, uh, it's, uh, I think, sort of fills a gap there. I think that's a good bill. Uh, in the criminal area, we now have the capacity to issue e warrants uh, electronically. Uh, this uh, offers the same protections for persons that are being searched. They would still get a paper copy but it's going to expedite the issuance of warrants, particularly in districts such as we have with so many counties and so far to travel. Uh, the district judges can issue these by uh, electronic. I think that's going to be very helpful in, in the criminal area. One of the most important bills, maybe the most important bill, I think we passed with the Juvenile Justice Bill, Senate Bill 200. Uh, it changes the whole concept of how we treat juveniles. Uh, it kind of follows 463, which is the, the bill, the, the overhaul of our criminal code for adults. Uh, it, it addresses these areas where we have status offenses, such as truancy, uh, and discourages and lockups and detention of juveniles, which is very expensive and very counterproductive in most cases. We're going to see uh, more involvement by court designated workers. Uh, this bill, I think, will get more people involved in working with juveniles uh, and maybe kind of relieve the courts somewhat. Uh, they don't have many options right now when juveniles are brought into court. So hopefully this will have some very positive effects. Um, I'll 
about to wrap up here, but I do want to mention the advanced practice uh, registered nurses, the nurse practitioners. We've had uh, each session a debate about the extent of prescriptive authority for advanced practice registered nurses, nurse practitioners. And we finally worked out an agreement with the KMA. Everybody is on board with this, which will lead to an expansion of prescriptive authority for registered nurses within certain parameters. Uh, and it's very unusual for us to be able to work out a global deal like this. And it's always the best way to pass legislation when all the stakeholders are on board. So uh, that's some of the bills that we did pass. Uh, I want to quickly highlight a few bills that did not pass. Uh, The, uh, the heroin bill, which you probably read about, Courage Journal has run a couple of really comprehensive articles on heroin recently that you might have read about. It has become a scourge in our Commonwealth. We seem to uh, we seem to shift that the, the, the drug users and traffickers always uh, kind of get a step ahead of us. We attacked the meth problem. We, we, we haven't conquered it, but we, we've done, we've made some major inroads with meth. Now heroin is, is seen to be the drug of choice. It's, it's cheap, it's a quick high, and it's devastating. Uh, and this heroin bill, Senate Bill 5, did not pass. Uh, it would have uh, expanded Medicaid coverage for uh, certain controlled substance treatment. Uh, it would have increased uh, punishment for traffickers. Uh, it would have uh, provided crime for those whose uh, trafficking in heroin resulted in a death or fetal death. Uh, there's a lot in this bill. Uh, the House had some disagreements in certain areas and they never were able to reconcile this bill before the clock ran out on us. But we thought toward the end, Tommy, that they would come up with an agreement. But Right out. Uh, I think this bill will pass in the next session. Uh, I believe the, the, the areas of the disagreement will be worked out. Uh, restoration of voting rights for convicted felons, House Bill 70. Uh, it's very supportive of this, and I was disappointed that it did not pass the House version under the House version upon the completion of a sentence or probation and parole, with the exception of a few crimes. Uh, voting rights to be automatically restored. The Senate had a different version of that, providing for a waiting period, uh, and that bill did not pass. Uh, we had uh, Senator Paul even came in and supported that. Uh, we had uh, a widespread support. The public polling shows that the public is very supportive of this. I think we'll be looking at that again. Uh, smoking ban bill did not pass. Uh, since we didn't file that, uh, would have prohibited smoking within and or within 15 feet of a public place or place of employment, hotels, motels, restaurants, places like that. Uh, the local option sales tax, uh, this was pushed hard by the Kentucky League of Cities and by CACO, uh, would have provided an option on the passage of a constitutional amendment for local governments to a local sales tax uh, by referendum. The local public would have to vote on it uh, for a specific project for a specific time period. Uh, it would sunset after the project was paid off. Uh, it was called it was called uh, lift by the backers, local investment for transportation. As it turned out, the better acronym would probably be lost because it didn't pass local option sales tax. But anyway, I think we'll see more of that. It's been very successful. I think 38 states. Tommy sponsored this bill, and I know we're really, really hard on this bill. It provides another tool in the toolbox for municipalities and counties to get some things done locally. That, but and, and it would be a four-step process. We have to pass the bill. The voters of the state have to pass the referendum, constitutional referendum. The local city or county has to pass an ordinance. Then the local voters have to prove it. So it, it's a very painstaking four-step process for that to be done. 
that covers, I think, a lot of what we did and some of what we didn't do. Uh, one thing that I didn't mention was Rubberina. I'm sure all of you waited for me to talk about Rubberina after we were runners up this year. Uh, Rubberina financing was not passed. I think it was about $80 million. It's not a part of the package. The uh, conference committee that Tom and I both served on uh, felt that they didn't quite have all of the financing plans worked out yet. Uh, one of which, a major component, was the uh, increase in the hotel tax in Lexington, which uh, would be subject to a local referendum. Uh, that'll be revisited, I think, in the next session. We did come up with some money, I think a million and a half, to be matched by Lexington to help in the planning process. So we'll be looking at that again, especially after all our players come back, right, Tommy? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, anyway, yeah. Um, I'm going to turn it back over to Tommy to talk about the road plan a little bit, and then uh, we'll have a little presentation and uh, open up for questions. Jerry, thanks. That was a great summary of the 800-plus uh, bills that we had to deal with and the ones that passed and the ones that didn't pass. Just a, a final comment on the budget you might be interested in. At the end of the day, the way the budget breaks down, about 56% of the dollars we invested, of the revenues we had, go to primary, secondary, and post-secondary education. So you might look at it as every dollar of revenue that the state realizes, 56 cents of that goes to education. 23% uh, of it goes into human services, CC, which a lot of that is Medicaid, but human services, everything the Captain for Health and Family Services is involved in. And then 11% goes into public protection, our criminal justice system. So. If my math is right, you add that up, that's about 90% or 90 cents goes into those three areas. So there's only about 10% left or 10 cents. So you can see why it's difficult if you know you try to cut the 10%, it's not enough to fund a lot of these other areas that Kentuckians need. But that's the way it kind of broke down. And one positive thing too I thought about the budget, as David knows, is that we were able to put in the budget about 500000 in each year of the biennium and co-severance dollars for Ohio County. David, when we first talked, and Jerry and I talked to you, uh, we were only about 250000 But we reworked the formula, uh, took some things off the top, and put it into the single county accounts, and now Ohio County is going to have about 500000 in each of the two years for economic development and other things to move the county forward. And I thought it's interesting, uh, for the first time, in history, I guess, the largest coal-producing county in Kentucky is in West Kentucky, Bill, and not East Kentucky. And Ohio County is like the fifth largest coal-producing county. And the coal production in Western Kentucky is doing quite well. And as you know, in a red, the coal production in Eastern Kentucky is not. They've lost about 6,000 jobs in the last 18 months in Eastern Kentucky, but it's doing quite well here. And fortunately, the coal severance revenues are coming into Ohio County. Uh, one thing that I wanted to end on, which I thought was really positive that Jerry and I worked on, and that was the uh, road plan. As you know, every two years we have to pass a two-year budget, which we've talked about. But also we pass the next increment for the six-year highway plan. We, we pass the next two-year part of that. And we did that in this session and ended up with about a $4 billion expenditure over the next two years, which is a combination of state and federal money. But it was really a good road plan for Ojai County. Gary and I had met earlier with David and uh, some members of the fiscal court talked about the needs in Ojai County. We wanted to get Charlotte more opportunities for, to expand arterial roads in Ojai County for commerce purposes, for ease of transportation. And this was a good budget. I just wanted to quickly summarize it. Um, Kim mentioned we were really excited that we got four and a half million dollars put in the budget. Uh, to put in a new entrance in the Bluegrass Crossing. It's such an incredibly huge asset, one of the best industrial parks in the state, uh, at the confluence of those two parkways. And uh, as you all know, it's, it's, and Hayward, you know this, you've worked so hard in that over the years, but Liberty Church now goes through a residential area primarily, which is not good. And so hopefully this alternative entrance can be much better, can attract more industry, can take away that obstacle. But that's good money that's in its, its SPP called state priority money. And, That'll be done uh, in the next year and a half. Um, another big project that we got done and we've heard a lot about is that 69 from Centertown to Hartford. Uh, we got $24 million put in the budget to
to widen that between those two points. And a lot of people that travel that road, it's an adventure. And a lot of times it's not. And so we've got $24 million in the budget for 69 between Centertown and Hartford. Uh, we've got uh, the uh, reconstruction. Of, uh, uh, let's see, I've got that. That's another thing. We've got the bluegrass crossing we talked about. And another area that Jerry and I have gotten a lot of comments about is that uh, the Livermore Road, 136, we funded what a year ago or less where the poultry tuck turned over, and those bridges are so narrow there. So we got uh, $11 million put in the budget to address 136, uh, particularly with those bridges and realigning those roads. So I thought that was great. We've got the money in there for the entrance into Southern Elementary School to take care of that. But the, uh, the big projects were the ones that I mentioned. So I thought we really had a good road plan for Ohio County, one that will help us move the community forward and have a better means of transportation and hopefully attract more commerce. Um, so that's, uh, that's kind of the, the summary of the road plan. The, uh, we do have a, a presentation we want to make, but before we do that, is there uh, any questions or elaborations or things that we should have talked about and didn't or any advice anybody has? Doug. Uh, I want to say thank you very much for the white lines we have between 69 and 54 and the white lines on 54. We still need those two bridges taken care of there and we need to get that northern tip of 69 going into Hancock County widened and the bridges taken care of the white stripes on it. Thank you very much and all the elected officials have done. Appreciate it. And one thing too, thank you Doug, that uh, again Jerry and I have talked to a lot of people about, but it's the bridge David leaving out of Lockport going across the green into Muhlenberg County is in bad shape and we've talked to the uh, Kevin McLaren the state highway engineer about that they're studying that right now they're trying to find the funds to address it hopefully that can be avail itself to some federal funds which we think it can but I've got a number of calls about the state and condition of that bridge so hopefully we're going to address it Charlotte, go ahead Jerry Charlotte, go ahead. Uh, thank you both for all you do uh, the caregivers fail in the big deal as well I think for aging help with uh, this year. Uh, I have a comment as a member of the health coalition here. You know, we tried locally to get a smoking ban and we just don't have quite <clears throat> the support that we need on this support. We do have some but that's just not enough yet. What are the chances of this passing next year on a static level? It seems like that might be the answer for the state. I'm not sure. What were some of the hindrances to get Tommy would probably be better qualified and answer that since he'll be there and I won't be there. But, but my take is that, uh, like a lot of other things, it's going to take a few sessions to build public support. And uh, these bills don't pass unless there's a, enough public support communicated to the respective legislators. So when they go to Frankfurt, they kind of know what they want to do and they feel they've got a consensus when they go up there and they're not going to get in political trouble if they if they do it uh, it's just part of the political process it took us a long long time to get a seatbelt law passed uh, and even then since williams kind of put it on another bill at the last minute to get it passed it, it didn't go through the regular process so um, I'll defer to Tommy on that, but it's got a little ways to go yet. Uh, I support it. Uh, I was a co-sponsor of the bill that the Senator then filed in the Senate. Uh, my feeling on it was uh, smoke is smoke wherever county you're in. Whether a county approves it or not, you know, it's equally as harmful in one county as it is in another county. But uh, it's, uh, it's got some hurdles ahead. A lot of people are working on it. I think the American Cancer Society and the Heart Association have been very, very active. A lot of other health-related groups have really uh, weighed in on it. So uh, I'll defer to Tommy on his assessment. Yeah, Jerry covered it well. CC and Charlie and Short, I think it'll pass in the next session. I really do. It's got more momentum than it's ever had. Came out of committee for the first time, came on the House floor, was just a few votes short. Candidly, if it hadn't been an election year, it probably could have passed. Um, but, uh, and there are some people that were concerned a little bit about having some exemptions for private clubs, some BFWs and that type of thing, which I think they were willing to do an amendment for. 
Um, the polls are very supported statewide. Bluegrass poll, Curry Durham polls, you know, 68, 70% of the people favor it. So I think it'll pass when we go back in the next session. And I know that we reference that you need more public demonstration other than the polls from our major newspapers. What can we do to demonstrate that public support? What would you suggest? Just, you know, locally, everybody needs to contact their local legislators, as you all have done with us. And, and it just needs to be done statewide because, you know, they listen and they need to hear from their constituents about their position on that issue. Okay. And I apologize for all these secrets. I think that's interesting. I think the local health departments have been very influential in this process. I know, uh, you know Will, Will certainly knows how our ordinance came about in Hopkins County. The fiscal court took it up and uh, after some uh, students from Hopkins Central uh, brought it to their attention and they handed it off to the health department maybe thinking that was going to stop the process well and the health department got real serious about it. They brought in the position from Madison County uh, up in Richmond where they had passed an ordinance and uh, they basically told the fiscal court we're going to pass this. Uh, we're willing to listen to exemptions and you know, work things out. The fiscal court wound up passing the ordinance. They never would have had the health department not been involved. So I think local health departments can be very influential in influencing public opinion. It's an education campaign and uh, perhaps we'll see it pass. Are there any further questions or comments? Uh, Frank, Frank. I think in the legislature I will be standing to exercise a point of personal privilege or something like that. Okay. The floor is yours, Frank. All right. I just wanted to acknowledge, uh, I, 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 didn't get, I got here a little late, so that mail have already been acknowledged in various requirements of the Senate, so this will probably be the last time he shares the podium to the Chamber of Commerce. Over the period of time that Jerry and Tommy have worked together in the legislature, I've been involved in activities such as the High County Industrial Foundation, promoting bluegrass crossings, with a wastewater district, new wastewater district, airport, all these types of activity. And I want to express as strongly as I can my appreciation for the dynamic deal. <laughs>
to the pharmacy, but uh, it's just unbelievable the meritorious service that you and Edith and your whole team have provided to this community. It is running David now, continuing that, and Melissa, and all the great folks that you all have working there. But what you mean to the citizens of Ohio County just can't be emphasized enough. And uh, Jerry and I just want to applaud you for what you've done and what you continue to do. And in that regard, we've got a couple of tokens of uh, our appreciation. First and foremost, uh, we're going to designate you today, uh, if you haven't already been so designated by friends, as a Kentucky Colonel.
And uh, from that point forward, I always had a very warm feeling for Ohio County. And uh, it's, uh, it's really been a great experience working with Tom again. And uh, everything he has said a few minutes ago are absolutely reciprocal toward him. And I've told him many times that he really makes me look good in Ohio County. And I sort of tag along with him. He knows everybody. And if I'm a little stumped on a name, I just sort of tug at him, you know, and just kind of roll right along. But uh, I just want to thank uh, all the folks in Ohio County uh, for giving me this opportunity. And I also will make it very clear that I'm your state senator until December 31st. And uh, we're going to continue forward, get things done, and uh, my door is open and my phone lines are open and we'll continue to be. And uh, I, I just, uh, it's, been, it's been a great experience, and I want to thank all the citizens from Ohio County for giving me this privilege. Thank you very much. Well, to your all's good benefit, we're finished. <laughs> but, uh, oh, yeah, we do have some handouts on the bills if you want to stop back here and pick them up. But I just want to end, and I know Jerry has said that, but. I want to thank you all for giving Jerry and I the privilege to serve you because it's, it's, it is a privilege, it's a pleasure, it's something we don't take lightly, and uh, we want to continue working to hopefully be part of the solution and not part of the problem, but thank you all for giving us this honor to represent you, and please let us know anytime we can help, and, but we value your input, we value your advice, because you all, uh, particularly through the chamber here, are working every day to improve this community, and we want to work with you to continue doing that. So thanks for your time. Appreciate the opportunity to visit with you today. Jerry, Tommy, thank you so much. Appreciate your leadership in Frankfurt. Thank you. Uh